Now here we see in, in Haggai chapter 1, Haggai is called to, to preach this message. It's a very short book. It's only two, two chapters here. But um, <clears throat> the people, this is, this is around the time when they're rebuilding Jerusalem and rebuilding the temple. And they're, they've moved back in and they're building their houses. Now, if you were to ask the people at that time, because you know it's, it's kind of an exciting time, they're, they're getting things back to, they're finally returning out of captivity, they're, they're trying to get everything in order at Jerusalem, in their homeland, and if you were to ask people what they would think, you say, you know what, wouldn't you love it if the temple was rebuilt? Wouldn't, wouldn't that be great? Man, wouldn't it be great if we can get this thing back up? Everybody would probably have said, Absolutely. Yeah. You know, their heart would be there. Their heart would be willing. Like, like that would be great if we could just have everything back to the way it was. They would be all for it. But look at what it says here in verse number two. He says, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. So I'm sure they would have liked for it to be built. They would have liked for it to just, to just be done. But it was a great work. It, it was going to require a lot of effort to get that thing back up and rebuilt back to the, to the glory that it, would, that it had previously. And they're saying, well, you know, we've got a lot of other stuff to do. We've got a lot of other things we've got to get established first. And then we'll get to the house of the Lord. Let's, let's reread re some of this chapter. Look at verse number 4. He say, he, this is Haggai speaking, he says, Is it time for you, and he's speaking the word of the Lord. This is really God speaking. Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? He's saying, you've got a roof over your head. You've got a house already built and established. And is it time for you just to dwell in your house while the house of God just lies at waste and in ruins? And in shambles, he says, Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. And that's the title of this message this morning, by the way. It's Consider Your Ways. Consider Your Ways. Because this is, this, is, this is preached about all the people. Now he's, he's directly going to the governor and to the priest. But this is in reference to all the people. These are the, those are the leaders that he's trying to get to, to stir up, to stir up the people to do this great work. But... He says, look, we need to consider your ways. Verse number six, you have sown much and bring in little. And, and this is what he's saying. Look at, what, look at what's been happening since you haven't been doing the work of the Lord. You have sown much. You're going out. You're doing a lot of work. You're doing a lot of sowing. You're planting a lot of crops, but you're really not bringing in much. He says, you eat. You have food, but you don't have enough. You drink. But you're not filled with drink. You're clothed. You clothe you, but there's none warm. You know, you, you have a little bit of all this stuff, but none of it's enough. And he that earneth wages, I, lo I love the way he puts this, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. Now, I, I know what that feels like. <laughs> Dude, you get your paycheck and it's just like, where did that thing go? Where did all that money go? I have no idea. It's gone like the very next day. But he's, he's making a point here saying, look, you're doing all this work. You're putting all this effort forth. You're planting. You're sowing. You're, you know, you, you got food, but you, you don't quite have enough. Why? Why is it not enough? Why is it that you're earning all this stuff, but it just seems to be brought to nothing? Thus said the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up into the mountain, verse 8, and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Ye looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when ye brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why was all this happening? It's because God was making it happen. He says, you were bringing all this back, and he said, I just blew upon it. I'm just making it go away. Why, saith the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is waste, and ye did run every man unto his own house. Therefore the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. And I called for a drought upon the land, and upon the mountains, and upon the corn, and upon the new wine, and upon the oil, and upon that which the ground bringeth forth, and upon men, and upon cattle, and upon all the labor of the hands. God is capable of doing so many things. And these people probably aren't even considering for a second that God is actually, you know, in a way cursing them and cursing their work and not blessing what they're doing. They're just thinking, oh man, it's another year of drought. Oh, this, you know, this, times are tough. And what it's doing, it's perpetuating a cycle. 
to where they're saying, well, I mean, times are too tough. We, we can't. I mean, look, if we had more money, if we had more food, if we had more, if we were doing well, then sure, we'd have plenty of time to go work on the house of God. But they're saying, no, you know, things are bad enough as it is. We don't have time for that. We got, we got to sow more. And they're spinning their wheels because they're, folk, they're putting the, the priorities in the wrong place. We need to consider your ways this morning. Consider our ways. Because when you don't prioritize God, when you don't prioritize the things of God in serving Him, it doesn't matter how much work you do, God's just going to blow on it. He's just going to say, nope, that's not what I want you doing. Just the way He did here. Now, obviously, this is talking about the physical house. Right, but there's, there's a much greater application that we can make to this even for ourselves today. We don't, we don't hear, this isn't part of God's word just to, just to hear about, oh yeah, that's what they did back then and it has no meaning, no bearing for us today because the temple isn't even around anymore. No. There's a much greater truth for us to learn from the Bible. Now, maybe you've thought about serving God more with your time. Look, time is precious. I get it. I understand that just as much as anybody else understands that. Our time is so short. You have in a day, the time just seems to fly by like nothing and years pass by. And oftentimes, so many Christians have this heart that says, I would love to do great things for God. Of course, you know, I, I want God to be pleased with what I do. I want to serve, you know. But then, but then someone asks you, hey, let's go out and knock some doors. Let's go out and win some souls today. Let's go out and preach the gospel. Let's do it. Well, today's not really a good day. I've got to go home. I've, you know, I've got this other stuff. I've got this work. You know, my refrigerator's broken. I've got, you know, I've got all these other things. You know, I understand every once in a while an emergency popping up that draws your attention. You know, people have to maybe miss church or people have to miss something because something just, I mean, just really draws your attention. But is that happening every day, every week? Consider your ways. Maybe you've always wanted to go out soul winning, but, but you're really busy. You feel like, you know, or maybe I've heard this before. I don't feel like I know the Bible well enough, Right? But then the same person, you could, you could ask again in six months or in a year, I, I still don't feel right, I don't feel like quite right. Look, there comes a point, you just got to do things. And I, I'll be honest with you, I don't think you have to take some class, I don't think you have to even have read the Bible cover to cover before you can go out and try winning souls to Christ. If you're saved, if you have your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ, I mean, do you know how you did that? Do you know what it takes to be saved? If you're saved, you should know what it takes to be saved. And if you know what it takes to be saved, you can take the Bible, even just one or two verses, and try to show somebody. Look, when you put forth the effort, and I'm not saying that person is necessarily going to get saved. I'm not guaranteeing results. But the Bible does say if you go out bearing precious seed, seed you know, weeping, you shall you'll return um, in gladness, bearing, bringing your sheaves with you. And I, and I grossly misquoted uh, that verse. But um, you will... God will use you. But the point is, He wants you to, to, to put forth the effort. Once you start putting forth the effort, He'll work with you. And He'll work on your life in ways that, that you, you've been wanting. But until you put forth the effort and start doing, it's not going to happen. I can't tell you how much I've learned personally you know, for a long time, when I, when I first got right with God, I got saved when I was 20 years old. I put my faith in Jesus Christ and I got saved. But for a long time after that, I lived a very wicked life. I lived a sinful life. I lived in the world. I didn't go to church. I didn't, do, I didn't you know, care that much about the things of God. Now, if you were to ask me in my heart, hey, you know, wouldn't it be great if you could live for God? Of course, yes. You know, my, my heart in that sense, yeah, I would love for that. But I wasn't doing anything about it. I wasn't considering my ways, and it wasn't until eventually I finally did consider my ways of getting a good church that I started to learn and to grow a lot more. You know, there'd be times I would take out my Bible and try to read it because I want, you know, in my heart, I mean, I was saved. I had the Spirit of God inside of me. But I really wasn't even learning that much. I wasn't growing. You know, there wasn't much going on. Why? Because I wasn't plugged into a good church. I wasn't, I wasn't doing any effort other than every once in a while dusting off the, the cover of the Bible and opening it up and reading a couple pages. 
That's, that's not what you need to survive as a Christian. You need the word. You need, you need the sustenance every day. And you need to be around fellow believers and, in order to grow. So when I finally got myself in a good church, I, I, I said, okay, I got plugged in. Now look, mind you, I grew up as a Presbyterian. So a lot of things were foreign to me in the Baptist church. A lot of similarities, but also a lot of things that are very different. I was used to going to church only on Sunday mornings. And then I, you know, I saw that they had church three times a week. I was like, okay, yeah, well, whatever. But I got to, after going just real quickly, I really enjoyed church. I really liked it. I liked to learn. It was something I wanted to, to, to go and be a part of. And it got to the point where it was like, you know what? I'm just, I want to be here every time. Every time that the doors are open because I was learning so much. It was a great church, but, but um, still, it was something that, that I wanted to do. But even after that, you know, I heard preaching on, on our, the importance of preaching the gospel to other people. And it's, it's obvious in the Bible that we need to do this. Okay, that's not the hard part. The hard part is not convincing someone, yes, it's our job to go out and preach the gospel to every creature. There's plenty of scripture that talk about that. That's, so in my mind, it's easy. Like, you know what? I know I need to do this. The hard part is actually taking the action and saying, you know what? I am going to do this. Because if you're, if you're anything like me, look, I'm a computer programmer. God has worked in my life and changed me tremendously as an individual, as a person. I get none of that credit. That is only possible through God. I was way more introverted, way more the type of person who only has a couple, you know, a, a small group of friends, didn't, dreaded speaking in front of people, dreaded. I mean, it made me sick to my stomach and, and nervous and hands shaking and I would have to have everything just written out word for word because I couldn't even think getting up in front of people is terrifying to me, terrifying. So the thought of going out, why would I go knock on someone's door? I don't even know who they are. I don't know anything about that person. What, you know, like, it's, just, it's kind of weird. What, you know, what am I going to do? Like, what, what are they going to say? And just all the fears that come up. But you have to get yourself to a point and say, you know what? No. It's, you know, I can't let my fear control me. And, and if you really just sit back and think about it rationally, what are you really afraid of? I don't know of anybody who's just opened up the door and just killed somebody because they're out preaching the gospel. I've never heard of that one time in my life. Okay? So you're not going to die. Or even just getting maimed or attacked or anything like that. Okay? Nothing. Every once in a while, you hear about the dog bite. Okay, yeah, I know. <laughs> I've been bit in my ankle before, but, you know, you could, you could be kind of safe with that, too. You know, dogs in the yard, just don't go into those yards. That's fine. But, but don't let that prevent you from going out at all. Okay? Honestly, what it is, you're just talking to a person. It's just a conversation. And once you start to do that, you realize, you know what? This really isn't that bad. The first time I went out sewing, I was extremely nervous. But thank God, I mean, I didn't have to do any of the talking either. I just, just went along as a silent partner. That's the way that we do things here too. You could go, we go out in pairs and you go with somebody who's already experienced, who's already knows what they're doing, who already is comfortable giving the gospel. You go out with them and you can just sit along and, and, just, and just get used to it and start to see, oh, you learn a little bit. This, is, this isn't that bad. I'm just having a conversation with somebody. Yeah, yeah, these people are fine. I mean, if someone's not interested, they just say they're not interested. You move on to the next door. It doesn't, you know, what does that do to you? It doesn't hurt at all. Not a big deal. But then you get those people who are interested. And they do listen. And they do hear. And then you see someone receive Christ and they just, you know, they, they like, yes, you know what? I believe that. I want that free gift. I want God to save me. Praise the Lord. What a great event that is. And that's what it's all about. That's why we go out and do it. But you need to take the first step to go out and do something like that. I know, I'm sure everybody in their heart that's saved would probably say, yeah, that would be great. I'd love to win somebody to the Lord. I would, I would love for that to happen. But it's not just going to happen on its own. The temple wasn't going to get rebuilt on its own. You can't just put these things off and say, I've got too many other things going on in my life right now, God. You're just going to take a back seat. We need to prioritize the things of God. <clears throat> I was getting off track a little bit with the whole reason I was bringing up me, me going out and going out soul winning and, 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 the, and the impact that God has made on my life is because there's a lot of things that started opening up in the Bible to me that I, I didn't learn before until you start actually 
doing the work and, and doing the things. When, when you get, gain some experience and you go out and start actually serving, getting your hands dirty and serving God, God opens up your understanding even more about a lot of issues. One example is, and this is common with just about every single person. Turn if you keep your finger in Haggai 1, we're going to be right back to it. But turn if you would to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. Probably the most common thing I notice with people that are either newly saved or just, just haven't grown a whole lot or definitely haven't gone out soul winning. People have a tendency to think that way more people are actually saved than are. People have a tendency just to, just to think that like, you know, well, they're Christian, you know, and I know this person and, you know, they go to charismatic church and they go to Catholic church and they go to this church and they go to that church and they say, but, but I mean, the Christians are all saved. Because at first you're thinking, I mean, salvation is so easy. I mean, it's just, I mean, it is, it is simple. All you got to do is put your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. That is easy. It's so easy to get saved. And when you finally grasp that and get that, you're like, wow, this is an eternal gift. This is great. You just think, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, these guys, you know, these guys are, they, they must be saved too because all you have to do is believe on Christ and they say they believe in Christ. But you don't realize until you start going out and digging deeper and having longer conversations and talking to people that they're not really saved. Why? Because the vast majority of people are trusting in their works. They're not, I mean, they say they believe in Jesus, yes, but they're trusting not in Jesus alone, they're trusting in Jesus plus them, plus their obedience to the law, plus their ability to, to keep God's law or to ask for forgiveness and do all these other things or to get baptized or whatever else that they add into that equation of salvation. And that's what makes them unsaved. It's just because they haven't put all of their faith in Christ. And it, it's real simple, but it's not always easy to see that until you start doing the work. And that's something that became much more apparent to me the more I got involved in talking to people and, and, and really asking questions because it's one thing to go up and say, hey, do you believe in Jesus? They say, yes, okay. Well, you're, you know, some people think, oh, well, they're just saved then because they said they believe in Jesus. No, you got to start asking, well, what if, you know, sorry, I, I, I love the what ifs. Is there, is there anything you can do to lose that stuff? What, I mean, what if you were to murder somebody? Would you still be saved? What if, what if you did this? What if you did? What if you broke this law? What if you stopped going to church? What if you didn't pray? What if you did something wrong and you weren't even sorry about it? Great questions. But the answer to all those is, yes, I'm still saved because I have eternal life because God promised it to me because it was a free gift. He gave it to me. But you don't, a lot of people don't get that until you start doing the work. And look, that's just one example. That's probably the most common thing. But there's so much more. You're in Hebrews 5. Look at verse number 12. The Bible says this, For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. And what he's saying, for the time, for the time that they've been going to church, for the time they've been doing all this stuff, he's saying, you ought to be a teacher. You ought to be teaching others. He's saying, but you're not even close to that. You're like a baby. You need milk. You need to understand the basic fundamentals of God's word and, 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 and God's truths, the oracles of God. You need, you need milk. You're not, you're not even ready to eat food. As a baby, a newborn baby, you can't give them a piece of steak. <laughs> That's not going to happen. They need the milk. They need to, the, the, to grow. They grow slowly and then eventually, okay, yeah, now it's time to introduce some rice and some, you know, some oatmeal, some other things that are softer. And then they move up to the point to where they get teeth and they're able to, to eat a full meal. It says in verse 13, For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Now look, there's nothing wrong with being a babe. We all have started there. Everybody's a baby at one point. And when you first get saved, you start off as a spiritual baby. Praise the Lord, you're a child of God. But we don't want to stay a baby. <laughs> you know what? I mean, how ridiculous would that be for me, 38 years old, to have to sit in a high chair with a bib and have my mommy just spoon feed me every single day or just, or just, just get some, some milk, right? I'm drinking milk out of a bottle as a grown man. And that's basically what he's saying to these people. That you ought to be teachers. You ought to be fully grown. You should be able to do all this stuff but you need milk. That's backwards. But this is how it happens. Look at verse 14. He says, But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use 
have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. It's not just sitting here and hearing that's going to make you grow. You can hear all day long. These people were hearing all the time. They were hearing every week. You could hear the Word of God preached. But what are you doing? Are you doing anything with that? Are you taking that knowledge and changing things in your life? Are you taking that knowledge and, and, and growing by, by doing more things and applying what you've heard and applying what you've learned into your life, into your daily life? That is what's going to make you grow. It's that exercise, that growth that takes place. When you hear something, is supposed, you're supposed to be doing this, why aren't you doing it? You know, if, you, if you're not doing it, then you're not going to grow. And here's the thing too, you, know, you don't expect to learn anymore. See, God gives us bits. It's precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. We learn a little bit as we go. God doesn't just open up our mind and just be like, boom, here's everything all at once. And you just all of a sudden are, are just expert. And you know all this stuff about the Bible. No, we learn a little bit as we go. And God opens up our understanding. He uses the Holy Spirit to open up our understanding about His Word. Now, if God's trying to teach you something, and He teaches you something, you say, wow, He gets this. But then you're not applying it. Why is He going to continue to open up your understanding about things? You say, well, what is He going to do with it anyways? What are you going to do with that? I'm teaching you this stuff, but you're not even using it. Why would I continue to just teach you my great knowledge and my great wisdom when you just blow it off as if it's not important? If we want to grow, we need to, to, to accept the stuff that we, that we learn and, and, and understand what, we, what God teaches us from the Bible and use it. Flip back, if you would, to Haggai chapter 1. Because this is what happened when, when Haggai preach this to him. He's saying, look, you guys are you're focused on the wrong thing. Your, your work is coming to naught. It's coming to nothing because God's not blessing you for it. Because you're not focused on the right things. Verse number 12 in Haggai 1 says, Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. Amen. They heard it. They understood it, but they didn't just leave it at that. They obeyed. They're saying, you know what? You're right. Let's get this house built. He says, Obey the voice of the God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him and the people did fear before the Lord. This is another reason why I think that people aren't doing enough of the work and applying it and, and they're, you know, they're blowing it off is because people don't have a proper fear of the Lord. Look, I know that we need to love God and that we should, you know, people, and people like to look down their nose and be like, oh, you're just doing it out of fear. You're just, you know, yeah, you know what? The Bible talks a lot about fearing God and keeping his commandments. This is the whole duty of man, fear God and keep his commandments. Sound familiar? It's Ecclesiastes. That's, that's, that's the, at the end of the whole book, he's saying, you know what? Here's the result of all this wisdom, of all this vanity, of all this work. In Ecclesiastes, he's talking about all the work that you can do under the sun. He's like, I did these great works. I built this great, you know, these great gardens and this great palace and all this stuff. And I built these things, but it's all vanity. What's going to happen to it? It's going to come to nothing. You spend your time working and building a business and building all this other stuff and, and doing things for yourself and building a great house and getting all these toys and cars and boats and whatever else. And what good is it? It's nothing. Nothing. It has no eternal value. We need to serve God, keep, you know, fear God and keep His commandments. He said the people feared. Why were they not serving God before? Because they didn't really fear God. And then they didn't even understand why were all these things happening. If they would have had the proper fear of God, they'd be like, look, we need to take care of God first. We need to put God as a priority in our life. We should get the temple built first. You know what? I'm going to live in a tent until I get God's house built. Then I'll worry about getting my house built. And it's not that there's a sin or a problem with, with living in a house or building a house for yourself. It's a priority. That's the problem. God doesn't have a problem with them working in the field and, and providing for the food. I mean, the Bible says that, that if, you know, if you don't provide for your own, you're worse than an infidel. So God expects men to provide for their family. But we always have to have God first. God deserves that priority in our life. And serving Him is what we need to do first. Now, I just wanted to point out there that people fear the Lord. Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 12. We're done in Haggai. Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 12. Then 
The people heard the preaching. They had the fear of God then finally and they obeyed. When, when, they, when they got that proper fear, they said, you know what? You're right. This is what we need to be doing. And they actually obeyed and they started to do the work. Luke chapter 12, we're going to start reading in verse number 42. Luke 12, 42. And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward, whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household, to give them their portion of meat in due season? Blessed is that servant, whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Of a truth I say unto you, that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. But and if that servant say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to beat the men servants, and maidens, and to eat and drink, and to be drunken, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and at an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in sunder, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant, which knew his Lord's will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not, and did commit things worthy of stripes, shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. So he's saying, look, the guy that knew what his Lord wanted him to do, he knew God's will, but he didn't do it. This is a parable. He's teaching us, he's going to be beaten with many stripes. Look, if you know God wants you to do something with your life, and you're just ignoring it, and you're not doing it, and you're not heeding the, that call and to, to do the work that God has for you to do as his servant. We're servants of God. Look, God loves you as a father, but he's got work for you to do. It's not, he's not just like, hey, just do whatever you want, and I don't, you know, go ahead and, and, and take your whole life and waste it, and just live on the beach, and just relax, and just think about yourself, and, and you know what, I love you, and everything's just great. Now look, if you're saved and a child of God, God loves you, but he's going to deal with you as a father. And just as, you know, I have real small children and they need to start to grow and they're growing, but I've got work for them to do. Now, it's obviously dependent on their age and how grown they are. But the more that they grow, the more they're going to have to do. And the more I'm going to expect out of them. Because to whom much is uh, given, much is also required. Now, we need to consider our ways because we've been given a lot. We have, first of all, we have all of God's Word completed for us and preserved perfectly, and we have easy access to this. I mean, pretty much unprecedented in history with, with, the, with the printing presses and, and how easy and cheap. I mean, it, you could go to the dollar store for one dollar, have all the words of God at your fingertips, right here, easy to read. People throughout history did not have that. It's always been much harder, okay? Yet we can see the work that they do. We can see the things that they've done for God. If you're saved, look, we live in a free country still. It's not going to continue that way, but we are still in, have the freedom to go out and preach the gospel without worry of, of lawful, you know, of something being illegal and them throwing you in a cage because you're preaching Jesus Christ. That's not going to happen to you. We still have that freedom. You ha we have so much opportunity. There isn't even really much persecution going on. Besides the fact it's not illegal, there's not even that much. I mean, how could you say, you, the Bible says, yea, and, and all that shall live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, but our persecution isn't that great. Look, I know it comes. I know there's persecution from family members. I know there's persecution from people. But really, it's not that great. Read Hebrews 11. You start reading about people who actually got persecuted. That is some serious persecution. Those people had a lot of faith that, that went through some very, very difficult times. We have so much opportunity, so much given to us. So, I mean, even just living in an area where there's people 
all over the place. It's not that rural. I mean, you could go and talk to so many different people. We have been given so much. You're in a church with people that honestly care for each other, that think about each other, that pray for each other, that are going to do things for each other. You've got a pastor that's not afraid to hold the truth from you. I'm going to preach the whole council. I'm not going to withhold any bit of information from you because I think you're going to get upset and leave and never come back. I'm not worried about that. I'm going to tell you everything that this book says to the best of my ability. Not everyone even has that. This is what you have. I will do just about anything I can to teach you and to equip you and to, to hold your hand as we go out to the next door and, and, and take my time to, to teach you the best of my ability to do this stuff. I am willing to do all this stuff. We hold preaching classes. Look, I want you to grow. Don't just, well, I don't have time for this. Don't just treat it as nothing. Use what we have. Look, God is requiring a lot. When you have so much given to you, make use of it. Don't just blow it off. Don't just think that, well, eventually I'll get around to it. That was the attitude that they had. We've already seen the punishment and the way that God's able to frustrate our efforts when we're disobedient. Because you might think, you may have this all planned out in your head, well, I'm going to do this first and then I'm going to serve God. Well, when you start doing that, what's going to happen is your plan is going to fall to pieces. Because <laughs> God's going to be like, no, that's not what I want you doing. And He has the power just to just frustrate and make it work and make it harder. And what you got to make sure you don't do is just continue in that hamster wheel and just keep going and going and spinning your wheels and not getting anywhere because if God's frustrating your work, you're not going to beat God. You're not going to finally get this done. Okay, now I'm ready for God. No. He demands our attention, our priority first. Think about Jonah. Right? Jonah, uh, I'm going to read for you Jonah 1. Turn if you would to Jeremiah 44. I'll read from you from Jonah 1. It's, it's a real familiar story. But in Jonah 1.1, 1, 1, it says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. So God has a plan. He's got work for Jonah to do. He said, This is what I want you to do, Jonah. You're my servant. Go out and do this. Go out and preach to Nineveh. Their wickedness is great. You've got to preach against that city. Verse 3 says, But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa. And he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he, he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea and there was a mighty tempest in the sea so that the ship was like to be broken. So he's like, uh-uh. I don't want to do that. I'm just going to try to go away from you, God. I'm going I'm to go over here. That plan didn't work out. And when you read the old book of Jonah, you know that plan didn't work out at all. God sent this great tempest, this great storm. He made all this turmoil come into his life and everything shaking. And just, you know, just all this problems and trouble came as a result of his disobedience to God. And in the end, the message didn't even change. <laughs> he, went through, he, got, he was on the boat. He got thrown overboard. He had to sit in the whale's belly for three days and three nights. He got vomited up on the land. And went through all of that heartache and trouble and trials. And God's like, okay, I want you to go to Nineveh. This is, this is what I want you to do. This is the message. This is what I told you to do. And he still went up and ended up doing it anyways. After all the fussing and stuff, we need to just, to just get right, right away. Because why put yourself through all the, all the turmoil? Serve God when, he, when he's called you to do something. When you know that God has, done, has a work for you, look, we need to just do it. Now, also, I want to point this out, too, because what, what we're seeing in these chapters is that there are negative consequences and there are things happening in people's lives as a result of not serving God properly, right? Now, we also see stories like in Job where he went through a lot of trouble and he was being punished, but he wasn't being punished for sin. He was being attacked by the devil, Right? And oftentimes, I think, we like that story of Job better because you don't want to think that the bad things that might be happening to you financially or otherwise is a result of your own sin. 
It's easier just to think like, well, I'm just being attacked by Satan. You know, everything's going wrong because Satan's attacking me. Now, that may be the case, but never start off with that assumption. Always consider your ways. Always think, you know what? Maybe God's trying to get my attention. Maybe I'm not putting him first. I know in my heart I want to serve him, but maybe I'm not actually doing anything. Think about that first. That's, I mean, that's the safest, the best way for you to consider in your own life. Now look, if you're looking at someone else's life, just think that person's like Job. We don't need to be thinking that, that you know, and, and the reason why I say that is because it's not, because we don't want to be looking down, oh man, I wonder what sin they've got in their life. You know, I want, they must be doing something real bad. Look at what's going on in their life and have that type of attitude towards other people. You know, I always assume, I don't want to know what everybody's sins are. I really don't because I think everybody here is just an extremely wonderful, great, perfect, God-fearing, God-serving individual. And look, I know we all have our problems and we all have our own sins. But if you have a lot of problems happening in your life, then I'm just going to think Satan's attacking you. But if, when I look at myself and I have a lot of problems happening, I'm going, where am I failing? Where am I not serving God? Because I want to get things right. Look, if you would, in Jeremiah chapter 44. We're going to see a similar thing that happens here to people who are disobeying God. But they perceive the elements, the, the things that happen in their life differently than the correct way of, of viewing it. Jeremiah chapter 44, look at verse 15. Jeremiah 44, 15 reads, Then all the men which knew that their wives had burned incense unto other gods. So Jeremiah just preached his whole thing against why they're, you know, they're serving other gods and, and excuse me, is really railing on them. Right? And this is, the, this is kind of the response that he gets. Then all the men which knew that their wives had burned incense on other gods and all the women that stood by, a great multitude, even all the people that dwelt in the land of Egypt in Pathros, answered Jeremiah saying, As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee. This is the wrong attitude to take when you hear God's word. Absolute wrong. Please make sure your heart is soft when you hear messages, especially messages like this that's trying to challenge you to do things for God and to serve God. Don't have this attitude where they say, you know what? All, everything that you said in, in God's name, that the, 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 in the word of the Lord, we're not going to listen to you. Verse 17, But we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth, to burn incense unto the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her as we have done, we and our fathers, our kings and our princes in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then had we plenty of vittles and were well and saw no evil. So you're saying, you know what? No. What you're doing, we're not going to do that. We're not going to serve God. We're going to continue to serve the queen of heaven. We're going to serve our false gods because when we did this, he said, when we were doing this, things were going just great. Everything was just fine when we were serving these false gods. And it wasn't until you came in with this, you know, the word of the Lord stuff that all of a sudden things started going bad. So we're just going to go back and we're just going to, you know, we're going we're gonna to serve things this way. Let's keep reading. Verse 18, But since we left off to burn incense to the queen of heaven and to pour our drink offerings unto her, we have wanted all things and have been consumed by the sword and by the famine. And when we burned incense to the queen of heaven and poured out drink offerings unto her, did we make her cakes to worship her and pour out drink offerings unto her without our men? Then Jeremiah said unto all the people, to the men and to the women, and to all the people which had given him that answer, saying, The incense that ye burn in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, ye and your fathers, your kings and your princes and the people of the land, did not the Lord remember them and came it not into his mind, so that the Lord could no longer bear because of the evil of your doings and because of the abominations which ye have committed. Therefore is your land a desolation and an astonishment and a curse without an inhabitant as at this day, because ye have burned incense and because ye have sinned against the Lord and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord, nor walked in his law, nor in his statutes, nor in his testimonies. Therefore, this evil has happened unto you as at this day. It's interesting how two groups of people can, can have completely different understanding of what's going on around them. They're thinking, you know what? 
well, yeah, we stopped burning incense on the Queen of Heaven. All of a sudden, all this bad stuff happened. And Jeremiah saying, no. Look, all of the bad stuff's happening because you already have been doing this, you know, burning the incense on the Queen of Heaven. You've been doing this for so long. God's bringing His judgment on you. What, why do you not get this? But he's saying, no, no, we're going to go back and, and just keep doing this wrong thing. And the reason why I bring this up is because oftentimes we have a short, they had a very, very, very short-sightedness. You have to understand who God is, that God is long-suffering, but that we also reap what we sow. And the effects of our sin oftentimes don't manifest themselves immediately. So what people do when they get problems with sin is that they'll start doing something that's wrong, nothing bad happens. And they get this false sense of security saying, well, this really must not be that bad. I, I, I mean, it, it probably isn't a sin or it's not that bad because, I mean, God didn't just come down on me, so, and then they continue doing it more and more and more. And then maybe they hear something later, they get convicted or whatever, and they start doing things right. And then the bad starts to happen. They're like, well, wait a minute, I'm doing things right now. Why, why is all this bad stuff happening? And then they're thinking, well, maybe I'm in the wrong church. Maybe I'm doing this wrong. Maybe I'm doing that wrong. Because they're thinking too short term. And you say, no, wait. Analyze everything against the Bible. And God's long-suffering. He allows things to happen for a while, but in the end, you're going to reap what you sow. And when you sow a seed, you don't reap from that for like years later. And we just have been planting trees and things and in the garden you know you plant that seed it takes a while before anything comes back to you so when you sin and when you do things that are wrong you can't necessarily expect god's judgment coming back upon you for a little while and hopefully by then you've already started to do what's right but sometimes god's judgment is going to come and it's going to come no matter what and you can't let that when all the bad things start to happen to you you know, I still have this feeling, and I don't know if it's true or not, I have this feeling like I haven't been judged for everything that I've done that's been wicked and sinful in my life. Now look, I know I'm forgiven of my sins, but still, I think about all the times, even while I was a Christian and just doing wrong, and I'm thinking like, all the bad stuff I've done, I, I definitely was being chastened and chastised of the Lord, I know that, but I still don't feel like it's come back. So I have to, you know, I'm always thinking like, when's it going to happen, you know? But at least now, when you have the right attitude, you could say, Hey, praise the Lord, when it happens, hopefully then I can just change that to be persecution for Christ and just, and just you know, I, I may have to deal with a lot of things. And honestly, that's why I believe happened with the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, before he got saved, he was going around, he was persecuting the church, he was putting him in jail, he was doing all this stuff. Then we see the great work that he started to do for God, but he also then faced extreme persecution. He was thrown in jail. He was beaten. He was shipwrecked. He dealt with all of these other things. I think a part of that has to do with him reaping what he had sown in his life. Now, obviously, the good thing is that he was able to use that to glorify God, and he was able to suffer those as reproaches for Christ, but I, I think God's got a way of making everything work itself out. But it's that proper under, we, you know, don't let yourself be too short-sighted. And I've seen people do this. They start going to a church and then like bad things happen. And they think, oh, man, this must not be the right church for me. Because they're so short-sighted, they just think that God's just immediately just like telling them, you know, don't go to this church. When really it's probably, if it's a good church, it's Satan being like, I don't want this person going to that church. Because they're going to grow and they're going to learn and do more for God. <clears throat> Turn, if you would, to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 10. We're almost done. i got a few more verses to re spend some time in Matthew. We need to consider our ways this morning. Are you doing all that you can for God? Hey, do you know God's will? Do you know what God wants you to do? And are you doing it? We learn God's will through His Word. His word tells us what he wants us to do. It's not a magical, mystical thing that you just are laying in bed one day and then all of a sudden it just comes to you, this is what God wants me to do. God's word is laid out for us. I don't believe that God speaks to us audibly or tells us things individually that are not found in his word. Now, I do believe that the Spirit can move us to do things, but it's all things that, that God tells us to do. I mean, it, I, I believe that I was led to, to pastor this church but being a pastor of a church is something that's, that's in the Bible and that taught, you know, that, that's very biblical of something to do. 
This is how God deals with us. Now, look in Matthew chapter 10. Are you in chapter 10? Look at verse 37. Jesus Christ said in verse 37, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. He that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. We need to make sure that God is at the top of our priority list. Look, I have a family. I have a wife. I have children. I love them tremendously. But God is at the top. God has my first, my first love, my first um, responsibility is to, is to God. Now, my wife and children are next on the list. Okay, there's no one else or anything that's going above them, but, but God is at the top. Okay, and you have to make your own priorities. But I recommend that, you, you know, Jesus is saying, look, if you love your father or mother, you love your son or daughter more than me, he says, you're not worthy of me. Now look, I get it. None of us are worthy of our free gift, but we ought to be striving to, to, to be you know, the best that we can be to, you know, to try to, to live up to the standard that he set for us. And this is what he wants. God demands our obedience and submission unto him. Look at ver, uh, chapter 6. Look at Matthew chapter 6. Because this sums up really... what Haggai 1 is about in Matthew chapter 6. We have a lot of things that can distract us. A lot of things in our life. There's so many things that go on with, with family, with a house, with whatever, with, you know, with, with your work, with your job, with all kinds of different things that can distract us. We need to keep the focus and keep the priorities straight in our life. Look at verse number 19 of Matthew chapter 6. Jesus says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The people in Haggai, their heart was on their other things. It wasn't on, on the things of God. It wasn't on the temple of God. It wasn't on serving God. Because... They were focused on just their temporal stuff, on their, their houses and on, on the work that they were doing. Verse number 22. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, those are strong words that we need to consider carefully. And I know this gets preached a lot. You've probably heard this a bunch of times. I have too. But look at what he's saying. He's saying, look, you're going to hold to the one and despise the other one. You're going to hate the other one. You can't have it both ways. You can't have it, well, I love God and, you know, I love money too. You know, I, I, I like doing, I want to work for God and I'm going to work for money. You know, he says, no. You can only do one thing at a time. You're only either going to be serving God or you're going to be serving for money. And he's saying, you need to serve God. Verse number 25, Therefore I say unto you, for this reason, because you can't serve God in money, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? He's saying because you can't serve God and mammon at the same time, you can't serve them both, don't worry about the things you need the money for, is what he's saying. Don't worry about the clothing. Don't worry about the food. God knows that you need those things. And if you're serving Him, He'll make sure that your, your needs are met, that your needs are satisfied, but you just make sure that you're serving Him. And this is difficult to do. Why? Because we all have a fear of how am I going to feed myself? How am I going to feed my children? How am I going to be clothed? How am I going to do this stuff? It's a natural fear, but it's a fear. 
And what we ought to be fearing is, what's going to happen if I don't serve God? What's going to happen if I'm not putting Him first? What's going to happen then? Because I could spend all of my time trying to do, you know, make the most money for, for my, me and my family and everything else. But if I'm not serving God, He's just going to blow upon it. And my, my money bag is going to be full of holes. And I'm, you know, the more overtime I put in, it's just going to be like, man, where is this stuff going? Yeah. I don't know what's happening. Amen. And it's amazing. How, if anyone could, you know, I could testify to this. There's times where, like, in, in, in real hard times, where it's been like the feeding of the 5,000. You know, where they have these five loaves and two fishes, and they're just, they just keep passing it out. And it just spreads, and it just keeps going and going and going. And it's like, how did that even happen? And I'm thinking, you know, with all you know, different things that come up and medical expenses and all this other stuff, and it's like all these things are just, just compounding, yet somehow you just make it through. And you squeak by, and it's like, how did that even happen? How was I able to eat last week? I don't know. I've been there. It's amazing. It, 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 is, it is a miracle. I don't know how to explain it. Like it just, it's one of those things you feel like you can't even math me. If you were to sit down and like add up all the stuff, it wouldn't, even, it wouldn't balance. But I think God just makes it work. Where were we? Because I want to finish reading this chapter. Verse number 26. Behold the fowls of the air. For they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought of the things of itself, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. God has all of his creation, all the birds, all the animals, Look, the birds aren't going around and saving up and have a, their, their savings and everything. God takes care of them, though. He makes sure they're fed. He gives them what they need for that day. And this is what he was teaching the children of Israel out in the wilderness when they were, when they were in sin and they were, they were being rebellious. They had their manna, and it was given to them every day. They couldn't save it. They couldn't store it up. They couldn't, they couldn't you know, it would go bad. It would breed worms. He said, this is what I'm giving you today. You have to rely on me. I want you to be focused on me. The, the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread. We rely on God every day. Don't get so caught up in this. And you know, I'll be honest with you. I like the, the whole like prepper community and the, you know, like, like I'm into that. Like, like that, that's interesting to me. But honestly, you don't need, you don't need that at all. I, I, I believe it may be wise. You know, we see... Uh, the story in, in Egypt and Joseph putting the food away when he knew famine was coming. So I think there's a wisdom to that. But honestly, when you're just serving God, like if you are serving God, I don't think God's going to make you go hungry. Even in times of trouble and things like that, if you are serving God, I mean, look at what he did with Elijah when he fed him with the ravens. When he was just doing what's right and all the famine and everything else comes in the land, if you are doing what's right and you're working hard and you, and you are doing your best and you're giving it your all, and you're putting God first, He will make sure, one way or another, you don't have to worry about the way that it happens, but He'll make sure that your needs are met. But you have to be seeking first the kingdom of God and not just laying on the couch and just thinking that God is going to take care of all your needs. It's not, it's not this, this lazy attitude of, well, God is going to take care of me no matter what. No, well, I mean, He wants you working for Him. If you're serving the Lord, He'll make sure you're taken care of. I'm going to close with um, back in Haggai 1. You don't have to turn there. In verse 13, he said, Then spake Haggai, the Lord's messenger, and this stuck out to me, the Lord's messenger in the Lord's message unto the people saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. Three times he mentions this is coming from God. This is the Lord's messenger 
in the name of the Lord. And he says, I am with you. God wants you to know, I'm with you. I'm here. Have that faith. This is coming from God. Look, I'm with you, but do the great work. I'm with you. Consider your ways. Do what's right. Don't worry about all of the other things, all the external things that are going on around you. I'm with you, but this is the work that I want you to do. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the Bible. We thank you for your words. God, I pray that you would please stir up our souls to, you know, maybe we've been relaxed and lazy on certain things, certain aspects of our Christianity that we, we know we ought to be doing. We know we ought to be serving you more, dear God, but we've just been kind of putting it off and, and letting other things come in the way. I pray that you would please just help us to be well equipped and, and to stir up our souls, stir up our spirits, dear God, to take action on the things that we do. I'm confident that the people's hearts here today are all are willing to serve. I pray that you would please help us to translate that willingness into action, dear God, that we can take that and move forward and, and start to serve you and to do a great work. The, the rebuilding of the temple was a great work, but when it was done, man, what glory that brought unto you and to your name, dear God. Help us to do a great work in this town. Help us to reach a lot of people. Help us to, to get souls saved, dear Lord. Help us to turn lives around and to change people and, and that you would get in and do the changing, dear God, but that we can do our parts as the body of Christ to, to be as helpful as possible unto others, dear Lord, to, to bring as many people with us and to, and to get people pointed in your direction, dear God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.